the dreaded the hearing, if you have a Bible um, from the church, it's page 799. If not, it's also going to appear on the screen. We talk about Jesus' children, the power, more specifically, the power to change. So uh, Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6, if you read in your hearing earlier, we'll read it again here. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6, reads as follows. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest to the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. The word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks be to God? Thanks be to God. Let's our prayer. God, we know we come from many places and from many experiences, and we even walk into a place like this on a Sunday morning, God, with a lot of things on our minds, but God, this is a culminating moment for us. This is a moment where you desire to speak to us and to have us receive. And so, God, I pray now that in all of our individual lives where there are conflicting things that may hinder us from hearing you, God, I pray that you begin to dispel those things away, help us to be fully present with you, that we might be changed and transformed. God, that we might please you in this space. We welcome you, and we welcome your instruction. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So about a few weeks ago, or months ago, Desiree and I were going to pick up Kyle a couple of streets over, and we saw a young child who looked to be about three years old sitting in the middle of the sidewalk crying. We pulled over to the side, you know, stopped and observed for a moment, and we could not see any adults, we didn't see any older children, because usually that road is like late with people walking up and down and kids playing, but he was the only kid sitting in the middle of the sidewalk crying. And so I guess just because the way my mama raised me, herself being, you know, very attentive to children as a retired teacher and youth minister and everything, and I get out of the car and I'm pregnant, so they're just like, you ain't getting out of the car by yourself, so he follows me. I stand about six to eight feet away as to not cause alarm, and I engage him. I said, are you okay? I said, you know, do you live close by? He stopped crying, and he said, mm -hmm. he pointed to one of the apartments behind him. We engaged him for a little while longer, trying to find where he belonged or what adult was connected to him when a man came out on the porch about five rows down, and he called his name, and it turned out to be his uncle. And when I was recalling this incident to someone else, they, they said to me, you know, Donna, that's something about where you grew up. Because there are cities and neighborhoods where you are taught you never stop. He said, you never stop because children are used to invite you into criminal activity or to cause a crime. So they are like um, bait for folks to walk into crime. But even though she said that and it made sense why people would be afraid to stop in a case like that, it rubbed me the wrong way. And it rubbed me the wrong way because it, it said to me, what is it about our society and what is it about our adulthood that says we would rather not risk our own, endangering our own selves in order to protect the most vulnerable among us. Even if a child is being used for bait to enter into crime, that child is not safe. So what is it that allows us to be, just on even a basic level, very complacent about the needs, the voices, the experiences of children. We have a tendency to place adult experiences above the experiences of kids. It is also very well known, whether we know it or not, that this society clearly even devalues those who actually serve children. We say we don't, but our actions don't meet what we say. The NEA, the National Education Association, says that the average starting salary for a teacher in this country is $36,141 per year. That's the average. There are some lower, some higher. Social workers who work with children is slightly higher than that, of averaging about $42,000 a year. However, the average programmer, computer programmer, makes $76,000 plus a year. 
And the minimum starting salary for an NFL player is $420,000 a year. Now I recognize that the amount of money that we make is not really connected to the value of the role that we play, but what it speaks to is how our society values that role in our world. Amen? Amen. So here we see this, this cycle or this pattern of what it means to devalue the most vulnerable population among us, children. Children who uh, depend on others completely. Children who have very limited power in terms of their physical capacity and economic capacity, right? And then we devalue the people connected to them to say that that's soft work, right? I can't tell you how many times as a children and you pass the people like, well, when are you gonna do real ministry? I was like, are you serious? You want to make me hot? You say that to me. Or you say that to somebody I know. And I'll go off by this preacher's whole sermon. <laughs> In one little segment. Even as I was preparing for this, I was realizing that though I've heard pastors and preachers refer to certain texts about how Jesus responds to children, I've never heard any of them actually take a text and preach it. Right? And so as I was looking, I said, you know, this isn't anything new. The way we kind of see children is kind of less than, the way we kind of devalue them, the kind of, the way we kind of overlook them or just, you know, dismiss them or become very impatient with them, right? Other passages of scripture, Jesus rebukes disciples for saying, no, don't come to Jesus. They don't want Jesus bothered, right, with kids. So this isn't anything new. This has been happening as a pattern in our world and our culture and our society for quite some time. But Jesus in this passage today, Matthew 18, really, really begins to bust open some of these cultural norms that are not as they should be, even in church. Amen? So Jesus is spending time with the disciples and they come and they ask a question. The question they ask is, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus does what, you know, is unexpected as Jesus does. Because, you know, this, this question that they ask really gets to something else. They're really saying, who has the greatest power? Who's most important? You know, who's the most valuable? Mm -hmm. Right? And so Jesus calls a little child over into the midst of their circle. And Jesus says, unless you become like this little child, you will never... Strong word, y'all. <laughs> Never, as in no more <laughs> Unless you become as this little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you become humble as these little ones, right? Only those who become humble as these little ones will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Because whoever welcomes them in my name welcomes me. But then Jesus turns real dark, turns the corner, right? And Jesus says, and anyone who places a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would have been better for them to have a large stone tied around their neck and then drowned in the sea. And I can imagine the disciples are like, whoa, like we, we just asked a question, Jesus, we just want to know, like how can we know unless you know this is like crazy? Right? Jesus is getting real serious in his discourse, right? But I think that there are some reasons that Jesus gets serious that we have been overlooking as a culture and as a church that really matters in terms of what Jesus grants us access to. And these reasons really revolve around how we interact with children and what it means, what that interaction and that relationship that we have to children really means. But before we dig into these, there's two I want to look at specifically. Before we dig into these, I need to give two precursors, okay? The first precursor is I believe that it takes a village to raise a child. Amen. So even if you aren't a parent and never birthed a child, have an adopted child, even if that's true, any child that you are coming into contact with on a regular basis or that you see, you have a responsibility and an obligation to interact with in a healthy and appropriate way. Amen. All right? That's precursor number one. All of our children belong to us all. All right? Precursor number two. I am not claiming that children are perfect. Anybody who has kids or works with kids knows that it often takes the patience of a saint. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, so, so what I present to you today <laughs> in sermonic fashion is not to 
preclude the fact that our children still need healthy discipline practices in their life and training in their life, all right? Precursors out of the way. The first indication that I believe Jesus makes in terms of this interaction that we have with Jesus is this. Learning between children and adults is a two-way street, okay? That means that children have something that we have lost that they are teaching us that God wants us to gain. This relationship is reciprocal. So it's not just I give, 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 give. But if I refuse to learn what my children have or the children around me have that I need, then I am not doing something right. So I believe that there are several characteristics that children have that we should probably pay particular attention to today, but these are not the only characteristics that, you know, children can teach us. But there's an old story um, about this emperor who was very vain and he loved clothes, right? And he would change clothes two or three times a day. And the word spread throughout his kingdom that he loved clothes. Too. So two scoundrels picked up on this and they devised a way to meet with this emperor. And when they got in to meet with the emperor, they came to him and they said, look, we have devised a way to weave a cloth that is so fine and so nice that it is actually invisible to anybody who cannot appreciate its quality. In fact, it is invisible to anyone who is too stupid or incompetent to see how fine it is. And of course, this king and his vanity, or this emperor, harps on it. He's like, here, take the gold. I want you to make me an outfit out of this. He says, you know, he's taking this here, and I can find out which one of my subjects are stupid and incompetent, right? So he goes off, they're making the call, quote unquote, Taking too long, he sends his prime minister. Prime minister comes in, he's like, yes, come on in, come on in, see the, see the progress that we made. He bend, bends over the loom, and he doesn't see a thing. And he's thinking in his head, okay, so if I can't see this cloth, that means that either I'm stupid or I'm too incompetent, and I will lose my job. And he makes a decision in that moment to decide to lie and pretend that he sees something that's not there. And he says, oh yes, this is the most magnificent cloth I have ever seen in my life. You guys are doing such a great job. I'm going to let the emperor know. <laughs> Goes back, tells the emperor a few weeks later, they bring this quote-unquote imaginary outfit to the emperor. And the emperor, because he cannot see the cloth, pretends that he can. And somehow he puts an invisible, non-existent outfit on. <laughs> right? And he parades, talk about Trump. He parades in front of his people in this imaginary outfit. And all of the adults in the kingdom repeat the same thing. They don't want to be seen as stupid. They don't want to be seen as incompetent. So they pretend that this is the greatest outfit the emperor has ever won in the war. But there is a boy in the crowd. And when that emperor walks by him, he yells as loudly as he can. The emperor is naked. <laughs> Here's the characteristic that we, that we need that children have. They are honest. And they are bold yeah. with their honesty. Yeah. Even with our older children, we see, as we, you know, as we see in Ferguson and other places, there's something even in our older children that says, if something is wrong and I am offended by it, I'm going to say something about it and then I'm going to do something about it. Right? right? People who are really fighting against injustice in large numbers are those who are wise and mature, <laughs> right? <laughs> Does not the Bible say that, you know, God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to shame those who are strong, right? So they are honest. Now, I'm not saying that we have to always display our honesty in the same way kids do, right? <laughs> because there is this balance between what we give them and what they give us. But the whole idea is that there is this power in not refusing to admit our own emotional state of where we are. Okay? There is this, you know, Jesus says, unless you become humble like a child. I have never met a person who is humble, who lies, and who denies authentically who they are. Why? Because that speaks to insecurity. And a part of genuine humility is about being secure in God, who God made you to be, which means it's safe for you to admit what you're good at, what you're not good at, how you feel, and how you feel in that moment. Right? right? So children are very honest, and they're bold with their honesty. But there's another characteristic. They are also resilient. Yes. Right? They bounce back. 
that I have had the occasion to witness the pastor's daughters and some of the other leadership team members' daughters, and they are just like, they're a posse here. Okay, I mean, they hang out, they have fun, they play, they laugh, they argue, they fight to the point of breaking down in tears. Only moments later to apologize to each other, to say they're sorry, to start sharing, and then to be crying because they have to leave each other. Right? I mean, all of this happening, I'm talking like in a 10 to 20 minute time frame. Right? So humility leads to honesty, and honesty leads to resilience. Why? Because you're not holding this stuff in. And so they get all this stuff out. Right? And then they realize, okay, it's out. I'm not harboring it. It's not growing. And they are, they are able to put into perspective that my need to be loved and my desire to love is greater than me having my way, yeah. right? Yeah. They aren't at a place in their life where they have learned that their pride should supersede reconciliation. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier for them to what? Forgive mm -hmm. and let go of anger. Because they know what's more important. All they know is that they don't want to keep feeling like this. Mm -hmm. They want to love and be loved by the people that they love. So you know what, let me say what I need to say, get mad, apologize, and let's be free as a kid. <laughs> right? Kids are honest and they are resilient. If they are not honest, it's because we have taught them yes. that in order to avoid situations that we don't want to deal with, it's better to lie than to be true. Yeah. We teach them that. Right? Insofar as we have become so consumed by the adult things of this world, right? We've been so preoccupied by the pain that we harbor, by the stuff that we harbor, that we feed this into our children. All these things begin to wane. But there's another characteristic that kids have that I feel like is necessary that applies to this back and forth, this two-way learning experience between us and children. And that is, they seem to have a trust mm. that allows them to continue to believe that the impossible is possible. Yes. The impossible mm -hmm. is possible. Quaker and theologian um, Richard Foster wrote in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, that the most effective prayers that are prayed in this world are prayed by children. Mm. Mm -hmm. Amen? So maybe if you got some prayers that ain't been making it through, you might want to stop and ask your for it. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I do it all the time. I will call my Lord over the heart and be like, Mom, I need you to pray for her. <laughs> Let me tell you what to pray. <laughs> but again, it's this concept that, that yeah, children have this, this ability and this power to, to really trust and believe. Right? In ways that we have let go of because we have been jaded by the brokenness of this world. Right? But they kind of remain in this space. They have this power, this ability. So one of my friends in seminary said that one of his kids came to him and asked, Daddy, can God make a rock so big and so heavy that even God can't pick it up? And he said he was stumped. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? And he said his kid said to him, I think God can do anything. Mm -hmm. I think God can do anything, without question, hands down, right? And here's a very important lesson that we need to learn from children. Children understand that they are little. Not all the time, but most of the time. <laughs> they understand that they are little and they operate from this space of, I am little, and that means that there are people who are bigger than me, yes. who are in place to take care of the things that are beyond my ability to take care of. a teacher because I can't handle this. They did something to me that I can't fix. Right? What would it look like for us to learn, relearn because we have it and then we lose it in this world? To relearn that there is this concept that we are little mm. in our humble selves mm. and that we serve a God who is bigger mm. and who has the capacity to do what is beyond our ability to do. Make the impossible possible. Yes. And how do we and breathe and embody that belief in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. So it's not just something we say, we say it all the time. 
But clearly, they ain't getting us anywhere. Right? There's something about us inside that, that doesn't click, that we really don't get. It. But Jesus says, unless you change and become humble like these little children, you will never have access to the kingdom that can make all the mess in this world right now. But that's our dilemma. Change is our dilemma. Uh-huh, it's our dilemma. Change is probably the most consistent thing in this world. It's one of the things that we will always have to encounter, but yet we resist it the most. I often talk about this process or this phenomenon called homostasis. Homostasis is this, is this principle of equilibrium, that when something in a system changes, some other quality in that system tries to change it back so that it can go back to its norm. So even if the change is positive, it doesn't matter because the system is used to functioning even in a dysfunctional way. The system would rather function in a dysfunctional way than, than function in a healthy way, right? On a very basic level, you get food poisoning, your body says, okay, this is a foreign bacteria, it's not healthy, I'm gonna purge it to bring equilibrium to the system and to stabilize the system, right? But in social systems, in terms of how we interact with each other, this happens too. If you start to make changes, even if they're good changes, somebody in your life is probably going to press you, consciously or unconsciously, to go back to how you used to be because they are used to functioning with you in a certain way. It's uncomfortable to change your norm, right? We ask about why women who are abused always go back to what they're abused. It is a very natural human inclination that if that is my norm, that's what I know and that's what I have been used to. Children of Israel did it. God delivered them from slavery. And what they do? They got out of slavery and they said, we want to go back. <laughs> this is crazy. At least we had food back. <laughs> right? Basic human understanding of homostasis, right? We always want to push back to where we are. So even though change is hard for us internally and we have our own systems of wanting to say how we are, we also have people around us who push against us to change. Change is hard, so hard, that two psychologists actually created this process of change. And this is it. I know you can't really see it good, but we'll put this up on the, on the website. So the first stage at the top is pre-contemplation, okay? This is the place where you don't even know you need to be changed, or you realize that you don't care, you just know you're not change. All right, you decided not to. Contemplation is I'm weighing the pros and cons of the change. And I'm trying to determine whether or not I really want to do it. You're seriously thinking about it. The next one, preparation. I've decided to change. And now I have to actually stop and do some research around what it's going to take for me to do that. I'm going to develop my systems of support, right? I'm going to find the steps that I need to take. Action is actually being in the process of actively changing, right? And trying to stay focused on not going back to your own behavior. Maintenance is I have successfully maintained a long-standing change around this topic or this, this thing in my life. And now I'm just trying to maintain it so that I don't what? Go to the next step, which is relapse. And everybody doesn't go to relapse, right? But those who do go through relapse and start the process again, research shows that they actually um, <coughs> learn from that stage of relapse and are stronger when they go back through the system a second time. Now, the powerful thing about this process is that there is no end. There is no definitive end to the process of change. Yeah. It never stops. If you have changed from the way that you are into something else, there is always some kind of conscious effort you have to be making to maintain that change. Yeah. Right? You are always actively involved in it. But even getting to this process is hard. Experts tell us that the most key factor, the greatest factor, in actually starting a process of change and being successful in changing long-standing behavior and patterns is finding the right motivation to do it. I believe Jesus knew this. So much so that I believe Jesus, in the second portion of this passage, gave us a motivation that we could not overlook. Right? This is the second indication that I believe Jesus makes in this passage. Motivation to change. Right? And that second is, children are the power God has given us to change the broken cycles of this world. Wow. 
children are the power God has given us to change the broken cycles of this world. So we know from a lot of history in this world that how we interact with each other or interact with this world as adults has a lot to do with our childhood and what we experience in our childhood. Yeah. Okay? And so I'm amazed as an adult of how many times I say exactly the things my parents said mm -hmm. that I said I would never say. And all of a sudden it's coming out of my mouth. Why? Because I heard it so much that it's hardwired as a pattern in my head. Right? And I have to catch myself sometimes. Right? Our childhoods are a very powerful time. This is the time where we are actually shaped. We are formed. And if we look at the trauma and the pain that most adults are causing in this world, they are usually caused by adults who were hurt in their childhood. Right? And so we become preoccupied in our adult experiences of managing the pain and trauma of adults. Not healing. Managing. Right? We manage the pain and trauma of adults. And while we are doing that, we are overlooking an entire generation of children who are actually perpetuating the exact same cycles the adults that we're trying to manage have followed. Only to later, in generations and years later, have to manage their stuff too. It's like being in a boat with a hole in it. And instead of plugging the, boat, the hole in the boat and getting the water out, you just stand to get the water out while the water's still coming in. Right? The whole concept is, plug the hole. <laughs> now let's get the water out. <laughs> I'm not saying that the pain of adults isn't important. What I'm saying is, if we ignore the steps that we need to take to stop the cycles, we will always be on an unending wheel like a hamster running around. Right? They say the children who are abused and neglected are nine times more likely to participate in criminal activity. And I would say that it don't matter what side of the law they are on, they are nine times more likely to participate in criminal activity. Mm. What is the implications of Jesus saying these very harsh words? It would be better, it would be better for you to be drowned in the sea than to put a stumbling block before one of our children, mm. right? Could it be that Jesus was pointing to a hidden power that we are very unlikely to see because of how we think about importance in this world. Children who are the most vulnerable hold the power that we need to break cycles. Children who are completely dependent upon us. So what would it look like for us to take a stance in the way we interact with our children? Not only do we say, I learn from you, but we say, I learn from you what I need to learn. I teach you what you need to know. And we actually work together to raise up a generation of young people who live not out of their pain and their trauma, but they live out of the trust that Christ is bigger than them and can do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Amen. That is what it looks like to change the yes. face of the world. Yes. And I am not convinced at all that it is not a trick of spiritual forces that makes us continue to be complacent and to walk over the one power God has given us to have access to a kingdom that can make all this stuff all right. Mm -hmm. Because we, what? We fail to remember that Jesus does stuff in very unlikely ways. So if we don't remember anything else, I want to leave you with this hope. And that is, though change is hard, and though Jesus has said that we need to change, change is about 20% our actions or decision to do so. And the other 80% is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we need to be humble like children because sometimes we block the power of God to come in and do in us what we can't do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. If you're willing, no matter what change you need in your life, or how you see children in this world, no matter how jaded you become, no matter how susceptible you become, susceptible you become to the brokenness of this world, God is saying, I'm here and I'm going to break through that. And God will begin to open your eyes, even just this week, to the children around you. So that you can interact in a different way. You can become humble enough to receive from somebody younger than you. Amen? Right. But also know that we are called to train our children in the way that they should go. 
but that means that we also are aware of the ways in which we have trained our children in a way they should not. Yeah. So my challenge to you this week is just to be open. Open to God. Open to the most vulnerable among us. Knowing that they have a contribution inside of them is something that used to be inside of all of us that we gave up because of how we were socialized into. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying.